Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning. This webinar will be one hour long, starting with a welcome from Mr. Remit Steiner from FAO, Forestry Division, followed by opening remarks by Daphne Hewitt. And then we will dive straight into the flesh of the webinar with the presentation of two studies, one carried out by CIDT and the other by Wecoft. The studies show that forest-based communities play a key role in protecting forest resources and improving the resilience of forest-dependent people in times of crises. Before giving the floor to Mr. Ramit Steiner, I would like to remind all participants that you may send questions to our speakers through the Q&A, the question and answer box on the bottom of your screen. We encourage participants when you do so to also share your names and organizations when you send your questions. Now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor and yes, and um, sorry, and um, after after the, the question and answer session, uh, the um, the session will be uh, concluded by Sophie Gross from the Forest and Farm Facility. Uh, before giving the floor to Mr. Edward Remitsteiner, I would just like to uh, uh, remind you that uh, there is a question and answer box, and I will remind you about this when the question and answer session starts. Um, so without further ado, uh, Mr. Edward Remitsteiner, Deputy Director of FAO's Forestry Division, uh, please um, uh, give us, please uh, we, uh, give us your welcoming remarks. Thank you, Alexia, and good morning and good afternoon to everybody who is on the call now. It's, uh, it's my pleasure really to, to welcome you to this webinar. It's a webinar series on COVID-19 and the forest sector of which this is part, and today is, is, is a central element of this because uh, the experience from forest communities of COVID-19 impacts, but also on how forest communities can and need to address the crisis is a critical element of, uh, of the COVID-19 response that we are now all working on in, in, in many ways. Because the forest-based communities play such a critical role as custodians of forest resources and at FAO, we, we have been working with uh, forest-based communities for so many years in so many uh, contexts that we also see not only how hard they are hit from the COVID, but also what critical role they can play in, in addressing it. It is both the generation of livelihoods and incomes for, for people in the, in the local communities, uh, but also for all of us who benefit from forests, it, both its products and its services in, in many different ways, in one or, or another. And as such, we are quite keen to maintain the community interest and the, the, the local farmers and the local communities, the local foresters at the center of our efforts to support uh, the quest to not only overcome COVID-19, but also to move towards a more sustainable production and consumption, if you want a more, a more equitable world where we halt deforestation, where we, where we reverse forest degradation and where we go towards uh, sustainable production of forest products in, in, in total. And as we go into this uh, pandemic, of course, a lot of the issues that were there in the past, they have been aggravated by the situation now uh, of, uh, of uh, reduced ability to make a living and, uh, and increased um, issues with health and safety. And all of this is coming as a, as a really hard blow to a lot of the work that has been done to build communities. But they remain a huge social asset and capital uh, that we have to build on and want to build on to mitigate and help recover from the impact and also help to build back better after hopefully uh, the second wave that is currently ravaging through some of the region in, in, in the world uh, is, is over. 
they have at least three key roles uh, and I'm sure you, you see many more, but they are really critical custodians of forests in the way that they that they maintain uh, uh, pressure up and monitoring up to to halt deforestation and forest degradation if they if they happen in an illegal way or in an informal way that shouldn't happen. They are critical sources of livelihoods, um, tackling poverty and hunger in a very real way on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis or week-to-week -week basis, and hence. Uh, are important to keep up the, the the basic supply of food security, of nutrition, and many of the things that are needed to help help communities go forward. And the third, of course, that is also very important is the production and trade of legal and sustainably produced forest products. It's the communities that uh, that could bring all of these things together in a in a good way, and hence we'd like to push for both uh, putting community in the forefront on the COVID-19 crisis and uh, towards achieving the SDGs. And I believe with the setup today, and I'd like to congratulate everybody who has, who has been involved in setting up this uh, webinar. We have speakers that will talk very clearly uh, from communities themselves in two regions, both Asia and, and Africa. Uh, and listen and discuss with them recommendations that come up from their li latest insights. It's great, interesting stuff that we are going to see today and hear today. So I'm looking forward and wish us all an interesting and inspiring webinar. And thank you once again for the organizers and for all of you to take the time to join us. And uh, let's, let's see what comes from the regions. With this, back to you. Thank you, Alexia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramit Steiner, for your opening, uh, opening messages. I would like, like to give the floor to Ms. Daphne Hewitt, FAO EU FLECT program team leader, for opening remarks. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you for participation. I see from the chats we have uh, participants joining us from all of the countries, from many of the countries where we have actually uh, been working and where some of the, some of the countries where the surveys took place. Um, as as Elwood mentioned um, and, and highlighted, communities are such a key stakeholder for FAO. And in the FAO EU FLEG program, we have uh, over 10 years of, ex of work with communities as key stakeholders in the forest sector for our support. The uh, FAO EU FLEG program implements the EU FLEGED action plan at the level of tropical timber producing countries. We directly give funds to key stakeholders to work on uh, improving governance, improving legality, participation, transparency, and improving policies and uh, actions for forest reform. This is uh, in providing support directly to stakeholders to enable the country's commitments to legality and sustainability in the forest sector. And a number of the countries have voluntary partnership agreements with the EU. Um, so, so, so for over 10 years, we have been directly funding communities and community and associations that support communities, both community enterprises and technical assistance to communities. Um, early this year, when COVID first hit, I think we all heard through international uh, development communities, from our partners, from our networks, a lot of concern about the immediate impact of the, of the restrictions imposed at country levels, concern about increase in illegal practices in, tim in tropical forests, um, and potentially uh, long-term impacts that that might cause in degradation and illegality, and also concern regarding the impact on the most vulnerable groups, which are the indigenous people and communities that depend on the forest resources for their livelihoods, and also we depend on to maintain the, the forests going forward. So in the wake of the immediate uh, onslaught of, the, of, of COVID, uh, two of our program partners, uh, CIDT and RECOV, who join us today, came forward with proposals to use their networks at the forest level to reach out to communities and immediately gauge the impacts. Some of them are perceptions, some of them are, 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 are impacts from the first wave of, of assessments that further work will be done. But it was uh, through these two partners that we've been able to get uh, from some direct feedback from the Forest Front and 
using this to make concrete recommendations going forward to help us incorporate com community needs and to use their role, community role, as custodians of forests and forest monitors um, to, to a greater effect going forward. So this webinar is an opportunity to hear the initial findings and the, the, from, from both of our partners, hear what they plan to do next in this area, and to direct all of us to further, further resources that will be coming out from the surveys, and also for some concrete suggestions on, on how to act on these recommendations going forward. And that's where we really welcome your input in the Q&A session to, to really use this as an opportunity to ask us here in the panel and our partners what is recommended in terms of concrete action by all of us in our respective roles as development professionals, technical assistance providers, donors, and, uh, and international agencies. So without further ado, um, I just want to highlight a slight difference. Uh, you will hear from Africa, from CIDT, from the Congo Basin. Many of their communities, the forest communities surveyed, have a monitoring role and do not necessarily direct, directly manage community forests um, attributed to them and have a very st strong role in monitoring of concessions and government commitments. And in Asia from Rekoft, there is a mixture of communities with direct forest management responsibility and those that, that, that not, but they all depend on forests for livelihoods. And I think that's one of the key elements that we will be looking at in recommendations is how to strengthen community structures going forward. So thank you for, for participating. And with that, I hand back to, to uh, Alexia to move us to the finding session. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne, for that, and uh, especially for your um, focus on different definitions that we uh, have of uh, forest communities, forest dependent communities, but the importance anyway of, of these entities um, in, in um, responding to impacts of, of COVID-19. Uh, I will now give the floor to our first presenter, Aurélien Dibain, who is Associate Professor of International Development at the University of Wolverhampton's Center for International Development and Training, CIDT. Dr. Dibain is the team leader of climate, forest, agriculture, and wildlife practice as well as the project manager for the EU FCDO funded Congo Basin Independent Forest Monitoring Project. Uh, Dr. Erilien, your uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Alexia, for, for the introduction and for the FAO for uh, engaging us in, in, in this work. Um, and, you know, we present a rapid appraisal of the impact of uh, COVID on uh, indigenous peoples, women, and forest illegality in the Congo Basin. Uh, next. So, as uh, uh, Daphne mentioned, uh, this this work, you know, was framed, you know, within our uh, capacity building project in the in the Congo Basin, where we're supporting, you know, civil society organisations to build the capacity for independent forest monitoring, and uh, we are fortunate to have received the support of the EU and the FCDO. Uh, in this area. Uh, the Center for International Development and, and Training, you know, we believe that really for um, sustainable, inclusive development, there's need to, to support individuals and stakeholders to achieve their, their full uh, potential. Uh, next, please. As we look at the impact of uh, COVID, you know, I also just want to, to take, uh, to ask you to, to spare a moment for, uh, you know, families that have, uh, you know, been brutally impacted in, in Cameroon by, you know, a massacre uh, that happened uh, last Friday just for, you know, kids being killed just for the sake of going to school. So I like that you spare a moment as we think about the impact of COVID on indigenous communities to also think about these communities that are facing a different type of uh, trouble. So we'll look at the study objectives, the methodology, the results and, and key messages that we derive from this study. Next, please. So really, we, we wanted, uh, because we're working at, you know, with frontline communities to assess the impacts of, of COVID, uh, particularly on women and indigenous uh, peoples and local communities, uh, but also look at the levels of uh, forest illegality, uh, but also the impacts on, on wildlife trafficking, and at the end, to propose uh, recommendations or action points on ways in which we could uh, support these communities, you know, to build back uh, better 
and to support the resilience uh, post uh, COVID. Next, please. So really, uh, we are very fortunate really that we have uh, in our view, you know, the, the biggest data set uh, at the moment, uh, because we're actually able, you know, to speak to frontline communities in terms of their experiences of, of COVID. Um, because so far, a lot of the evidence that we've had from the impacts of COVID, a lot of it has been anecdotal or, you know, using secondary uh, modeling. And so we're really dealing here with impacts uh, that have been faced by frontline communities in uh, the Congo Basin. Uh, to do so, we first of all, with support of the partners, provided uh, support to communities, uh, provided uh, training on soap making, PPE to these communities. Uh, this helped to build confidence, and then we then went back uh, to those communities with our national partners in a socially distanced way to gather evidence of the impacts of COVID uh, on these communities. You will see that we were able to, to collect close to 7,000 questionnaires. Uh, these were then uh, data cleaned and then analyzed using. Uh, NVivo 11 and Excel. Uh, next slide, please. Next. So just to give you an indication of those who took part in our survey, we wanted to, to, to highlight this point uh, to further uh, support the view that really these were communities at the forefront, uh, forest dependent communities. You find that most of our respondents, um, you know, were, were farmers, you know, uh, involved in, you know, uh, private employees, you know, involved in uh, trading uh, in the communities. And so, you know, they, they were really uh, directly impacted by uh, the pandemic. Next slide, please. The first thing we wanted to find out was looking at the levels of uh, forest uh, control, looking at the presence of the forestry administration. And I think you'll find from uh, the evidence that in all countries, so DRC, uh, Cameroon and Congo, where uh, these results were, were carried out, there was significant you know, absence of uh, government forest control services uh, on the ground. And, and the communities you know, reported this by uh, the fact that if you look at the checkpoints, they were, they were absent, they were closed. Uh, you know, they couldn't see any forest uh, officials on the ground uh, carrying out controls. So really it created the environment uh, that allowed for illegality to persist. Uh, next slide, please. So as I've just mentioned, you see, that in, in DRC, uh, in Cameroon and in Republic of Congo, that the respondents reported significant uh, increases in the levels of uh, illegal logging uh, during the period of, of the pandemic. And a, a lot of this, uh, in terms of the qualitative data that we received was communities seeing individuals from the cities coming in with chainsaws, going into forest, cutting timber and leaving the forest. So there was that overall perception, and you see this is uh, uh, consistent in all countries, that communities saw uh, there was this perception that illegal logging uh, had actually increased in, in all the areas. And we said this could be linked also to the uh, absence of government presence uh, and control function uh, on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. Knowing that COVID you know, is a zoonotic uh, disease, we also wanted to find out in terms of the perceptions, particularly with regards to illegal wildlife trafficking during this period. And interestingly, we'll find that in all three countries, the, the responses were that they thought that illegal wildlife trafficking uh, had declined during the pandemic. And a lot of the responses uh, as to why was the fact that people, there was a lot of fear, knowing that uh, you know, COVID was resulting from uh, you know, wildlife, you know, human interaction. So there was this fear that, you know, maybe getting into this area might further perpetuate uh, the, uh, the expansion of, of, of the pandemic. And so we see here uh, communities reporting this perception of uh, lower uh, levels of uh, illegal wildlife trafficking uh, during period. Next slide, please. Now, in, in concrete terms, what, what does this mean for, for communities? So we, we, we did ask them, you know, how has this pandemic impacted yourselves? And, and you'll see that overall, that the respondents in, in DRC, 86% in Cameroon, 57% uh, uh, and in Congo, this was the earliest uh, study uh, survey that was carried out in Congo. And you find that at that point, 97% of the respondents indicated that uh, they had been impacted negatively by the pandemic. Next slide, please. Now, the question here is, you know, if 
any of us, you know, taking part in this, if we're, you know, how would you survive with 25% of your income per month or for over six, a period of six months? Uh, and so we, we try to find out from the communities, you know, what's the impact on, on incomes? And you find that in GRC, 87% of the respondents, we're talking about uh, close to 4,600 respondents in DRC, 87% reported a decline in the incomes, with, with women reporting is more decline in the incomes compared to, to men. And when we break that down by the level of decline in income, you actually find that the same te tendency was uh, found with 42% of women reporting over 50% decline in their incomes and 26 to 50% reporting, uh, you know, 26 to 50% decline. So that's for women, uh, close to 80% decline in, in their incomes. Now we ask the question as well for all the respondents, what were the impacts on uh, indigenous peoples and local communities there? And you find a significant decline in economic activity. One thing to want to flag, flag out, which we will not typically pick up from these types of studies, is the impact on domestic violence against women and against indigenous communities during this period. So in addition to a decline in economic activity, we also found this impact on, uh, on women. Uh, and this is something really to be aware of. Next slide, please. Now, specifically looking at women, I've already reported the issue of decline in, uh, in the, uh, the uh, rise in domestic violence, but of course, you also found a decline in their activities trade. Many of these women, you know, taking part in the marketing of non-timber forest uh, products, there was a decline, a reduce in clientele, and that, of course, translated to their inability to uh, take care of their households. Next slide, please. So we then asked them, you know, what to do then? And, and you see that there was a lot of strong focus look, looking at DRC on the role of the government, uh, you know, in, in terms of strengthening uh, local forest control, increasing sanctions on illegality, but a lot of it was about, we need support, support to communities. Next slide, please. So what type of support was being requested? Financial support, we need financial support. We need opportunities for job creation support to community enterprise to allow these communities to build back, economic strengthening around price support, but also around agriculture. How do we access production inputs and to access markets? And we also saw uh, an issue here around, you know, supporting forestry activities. How do we make forestry more legal and sustainable, but also building uh, social cohesion measures? Because clearly with the pandemic, uh, the community uh, meetings, community activities, uh, were, were uh, actually uh, reduced during the period, but of course, mental health support, and there was need to continue to sensitize communities. And of course, it, it clearly shows that people are waiting for vaccination. If there's a vaccination, then it is possible that this can go a long way also to support the recovery. Next slide, please. So in terms of recommendations, uh, moving towards the end, there's clearly a need you know, to strengthen civil society engagement in monitoring what is happening at the forest level, particularly with the use of uh, digital technologies, because of course, even civil society organizations were constrained from accessing forests and for also carrying out the monitoring function. This need really to support engagement of independent uh, indigenous communities and women to take part in the post recovery uh, activities. It shouldn't be that these decisions on how to build back better are taken in capital cities without the engagement of women and indigenous communities. They should be facilitated to take a seat at the table strengthen their capacities so that they are able to strengthen their resilience. And community forestry, we think, also provides a strong lever and entry point in this area. There's also the fact that how do we build back better? It's also about supporting nature-based solutions, uh, solutions that will impact on climate, but also improve biodiversity. And I've also mentioned really the need to focus on the social, so, uh, psychosocial aspect of the support to communities. And, and finally, Communities being at the forefront, they are the best in terms of their ability to denounce illegality. And this was demonstrated with our partners with an increase in the number of alerts and, uh, and that were received by, the, by our NGO partners that are carrying out independent forest monitoring in the Congo Basin. And so systems that support monitoring will go a long way to, uh, to, to improve forest legality. Next slide, please, and the final one. So lastly, we can only build back better, really, if we maintain the focus on legality and sustainability, that we're not derailed by the pandemic, and that commitments that have been made by governments 
to fight illegality, to stop illegal deforestation that are maintained, but also the climate change commitments that have been made by governments. And finally, we need to strengthen as well uh, government law enforcement capacity and support the domestic timber market to legalize, to engage in legal trade in timber. And this we think is a way to help to curb the rise in illegal logging that we're identifying. So I thank you very much for listening uh, and over uh, to you, uh, Alexia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Zbain, for your uh, for uh, sharing your experience and your uh, recommendations. I will now give the floor to uh, Dr. David Gantz from RECOFC to um, uh, talk to us about his um, findings of the studies in Asia. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, just a clarification, our name is Rikoft. You don't, you can drop the C, it's a silent C, uh, but I, I know a lot of people still call us Rikoff TC or Rikoff C. Uh, the research I'm about to present is a collective effort uh, from many people at my institution, the, the one I'm leading, as well as members of FAO EU FLECT program, in particular those here in the RAP office. And I want to acknowledge them uh, before I begin. Next slide, please. So first, uh, a little bit about RECOF and the importance of this research for us. Uh, we believe in a future where people live equitably and sustainably in and beside healthy, resilient forests. Uh, and that's why we're looking at this, this kind of uh, resiliency. We take a long-term landscape-based approach, an inclusive approach to help local communities secure their land and resource rights build alternative livelihoods, achieve gender equality, and combat climate change. In this way, we see the, the opportunity to build resilience to crises like COVID-19 through the entry point of community forestry. Next slide, please. As Daphne already mentioned, it's very important to understand the term uh, about community forestry is a uh, this is a broad term for approaches that empower people to manage and protect and benefit from local forests. These approaches have different names in different parts of the world. Uh, in Indonesia, they call it social forestry. In Laos, they call it village forestry. Many people use participatory forestry, community-based forest management, and people-centered forestry. So the, the names uh, really differ, but the, they vary in the extent to which they give communities the rights to use and benefit from those forest resources. For example, some allow communities only the right to use forest resources for subsistence or home use, whereas others allow communities to set up forest enterprises and sell commercial forest products. Community forests are formally structured and organized, and most have uh, formal community forestry user groups that are governed by an elected management committee. Uh, that committee oversees the development and implementation of regulations on forest use and forest management plans and activities. And these committees also manage funds and bank accounts, which is an important um, asset to, to consider here. Community forestry is widespread in Asia where it has raised the living standards of forest communities while protecting and expanding the, the forest area. Uh, research shows that community forestry is a solution for achieving many of the sustainable development goals as well as the climate goals of the Paris Agreement. However, we have limited research right now on how community forestry and re related tenure schemes help people cope with uh, COVID-19 and recover from similar disasters and crises. So this is the gap that we're really trying to address here. Next slide, please. A little bit about the research. Uh, the aim of the research that FAO and RECOF undertook is we really wanted to know whether or not community forestry contributed to the resilience of communities that depend on the forest during the pandemic's onset and how this possible contribution could be strengthened, the contribution to their resilience. Uh, who was surveyed? Uh, we surveyed 435 people in seven RECOF focal countries. 
those countries are Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, PDR, Myanmar, Nepal, Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, that's about 60 people per country. Nearly half were from the national majority group and half were from minority groups. And about a third were women who responded to this survey. All surveys were done um, on the phone and in the local languages. Uh, this was not an online survey because we found that for frontline um, forest user groups, we needed to actually pick up the phone and call them. We had about 47 questions in our survey. Next slide, please. The context for the research, uh, like I said, this is really a, about asking these critical three questions. And the study took place early in the pandemic between June and July, 2020. And it focused on the immediate impacts and restrictions on ordinary life and economic activity. At this time, most respondents were still able to cope using their own savings and also by reducing their expenditures, reducing their, their cost of living. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to move into some of the findings. Um, there are uh, eight key findings. Uh, here are the first three. Finding one, the study confirmed that forests provide a wide variety of uses and products to local people across all seven countries. And while people's, people collected forest products for mostly home use, um, and, and sale, most said that they were selling agricultural prod products as their main source of income. The next finding, finding two, the ability to sell forest products provides community forest members with income that can be saved and used in a time of crisis. More than a third of the community forest members sold timber or non-timber forest products as a main source of income and nearly half of those said that using the savings from those sales was a moderately or very important coping mechanism. We found that a fifth of the community forest members used income generated from community forestry as an important coping mechanism during the lockdown. Based on these findings, we estimate that 3 million community forest members across the lower Mekong countries, the five lower Mekong countries, depended significantly on their savings generated by selling community forest products to cope during the lockdown. Finding three negative impacts of the lockdown on livelihoods and food security were widespread across all the groups that we surveyed and 80% of those interviewed said they suffered uh, such effects from the lockdown and 49% of them reported not being able to sell their forest products because there were no buyers or the prices were so depressed that trading them really didn't make sense. They were not profitable, so they didn't sell those products. Next slide, please. Finding four, uh, COVID-19 and the lockdown affected women and men differently. Uh, we already heard this from, uh, from Dr. Aurelian uh, in, in the Congo Basin. In Thailand and Indonesia, women were more likely than men to say that they had experienced negative impacts of the lockdown on their livelihoods and on food security. And across all the countries, many more women than men reported having greater workloads because of homeschooling and family health care uh, responsibilities. Respondents reported increased incidents of domestic violence, in particular in Vietnam, where 13% said this. This is also a similar finding to the African region. Finding number five, although travel restrictions prevented people from accessing markets and selling their forest products, they did not prevent most people from accessing or harvesting from their own forest, except in Vietnam. Overall, most forest users did not report having changed their use of forests during the lockdown. However, the situation was a bit different in Myanmar and in Vietnam where respondents did say the lockdown changed their forest use. Finding six, in all countries except Vietnam, interviewees reported that community forest committees uh, helped to protect their forests from illegal harvesting, uh, poaching, encroachment during the lockdown. And in most countries, this was the second most commonly cited uh, form of support after the provision of information about COVID-19 and its spread. And in Cambodia and Myanmar, one in five respondents reported an increase in illegal activities as one of their major concerns. 
Finding seven, half of the community forest members interviewed said that their committees had provided support to its members. Very important finding here. Across all seven countries, uh, only 42% of the community forests said that they had received support from governments or civil society organizations, uh, organizations like RECOF. This suggests that community forest committees could play an important role in a, in a future crises, but we need to do a better job of, uh, they would need to do a better job of, of being organized and supported as well as have strong links or good links with uh, local authorities. Uh, the last finding is that forests did help uh, people cope, but what forest users really need is ad additional economic support, very similar to uh, one of Aurelian's findings. Small credit schemes uh, linked to community forest committees could uh, address many of these, uh, these needs and these interviewees uh, identified them. We asked them what they needed to help them recover from the impacts of the pandemic. And 76% of all community forest users expressed a great need for either a cash loan, a cash grant, or debt cancellation. And given that most community forest committees have access to bank accounts, uh, these findings suggest that community forest committees could fill this gap by managing either local microcredit schemes or revolving loans, but right now many of them lack the funds or the capacity to do so. Next slide. Seven things we must do now. Our preliminary findings point to these seven actions that we should take to support forest communities in their efforts to recover and build back better. Next slide, sorry. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Uh, the first action, increase the ability of community forest members to access credit or emergency grants, as I just mentioned. We should create and strengthen community forest funds as credit mechanisms. For example, we should establish and support village savings and loan associations or revolving funds. These kind of mechanisms will help poor communities cope with personal emergencies in these times of need. Uh, this could play a larger role in helping communities prepare and cope with disasters as we've seen with COVID-19, but certainly will prepare them for a second wave or whatever disasters may come their way. The second one is build the capacity of community forest committees to support members in these crisis situations. Government donors and civil society organizations should provide resources and information during emergencies and, and training in disaster preparedness and response, but we certainly can do a lot more. Number three, uh, community forest committees should consider potential crises in their planning. This is also a really important point. To improve their ability to mobilize support, increase the flexibility in the use of their resources and organize finances to provide grants or loans or these kind of emergency funds as needed. Um, in addition, they should also build capacity to disperse funds efficiently and fairly amongst the community forest members. Um, fourth, fourthly, all sectors should emphasize gender equality in their investments. We recommend that awareness and sens sensitization training be greatly expanded, and this is just a starting point of what needs to happen. Fifth, we need to strengthen the capacity of community forest groups to tackle forest crimes and by strengthening social cohesion and investing in these community institutions and providing legal tenure to local people, community forestry can be a key approach to preventing illegal activities across the region and across the world. Six, we can improve digital access to warn people of disasters and crises, inform them how to respond. This will also increase their access to market information and insights that can help them identify market opportunities for their products, grow their forest enterprises, and certainly become more profitable and streamline their market chains. Number seven, focus donor support and technical assistance on forestry training and job opportunities with emphasis on fields like forest land, uh, forest landscape restoration, forest management. This can improve forest carbon storage, productivity, certainly mitigate climate change, but also increase the benefits forest communities receive from their lands. Next slide, please. 
So what's next? Um, in our second phase, we will survey communities with community forests in seven countries that demonstrated in this first phase strong coping strategies and high levels of resilience to the negative impacts of COVID-19, as well as those communities that did not. We will be taking kind of a case study approach to be conducted uh, from January to March of next year, 2021. Next slide, please. This research will identify factors that build or weaken the ability of community forestry as a strategy to build the resilience of forest communities to disasters and crises like COVID-19. But we also want this research to recommend policies and interventions that can strengthen community forestry as a social and economic safety net. Next slide, please. And thank you very much. In closing, I would like to say that community forestry really empowers people to manage, protect, and benefit from local forests. And this study has confirmed that this mechanism should be promoted and strengthened. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gantz, for sharing the findings of your study and for identifying key actions going forward. We now have about 15 minutes for the question and answer session. Um, I would like to remind participants to use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen to write your questions. And we encourage you to provide your name and organization when you write your question. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for this question and answer session. And so unfortunately, we will not be able to answer all questions today. However, we will be um, recording any, uh, all the questions that you write in the question and answer box and any unanswered questions will be addressed in the next couple of days and will be sent to all participants alongside this event's recording. Our first question is, okay, um, yes, uh, Supra Patnaik is asking um, how have um, co forest communities coped with the double exposure such as COVID-19 and the climate crisis? Um, who would like to take that question, uh, Dr. Gantz? Sure, um, I think that in, in many forest communities, uh, they view these two crises as as one, uh, they, they ultimately have been dealing with climate change much longer uh, than most of us in terms of uh, immediate impacts from whether it be a typhoon like uh, we're seeing hitting central Vietnam or uh, changes in precipitation with droughts and floods. This region in particular seems to have um, even more uh, dramatic shifts in either too much water or not enough water over the last four or five years. Um, and now as a result, we're also seeing uh, tremendous wildfires in places that typically do not burn uh, in Northern, or not burn as, as dramatically. Um, so for the, the frontline communities that are, are addressing COVID-19 impacts, I think they've already been addressing climate change uh, impacts on them, but the exacerbation of these two right now, a lot of the strategies I would say are very much the same. When you talk about economic support or these microfinance support, um, the gender equality issues, as uh, Dr. Relian said, are just exacerbated uh, by these two crises, and they're, uh, you know, they're expounding on themselves to make things even worse. Um, but our interventions and our strategies certainly can be. Uh, addressing both at the same time. Oops. Thank you for, for your reply. Uh, Dr. Dubain, would you like to uh, add something to Dr. Gans's uh, reply? I think that was quite a you know comprehensive uh, response, but, but I think that from, from our own study, I think we've, we've seen a lot of you know, community 
uh, cohesion, you know, in terms of, you know, communities using their community uh, safety nets and, and, and networks, you know, to, to support each other during, uh, during this, uh, this pandemic, uh, particularly, you know, in the face of, you know, uh, low levels of, uh, of, of, of savings or assets, you know, that have basically been, been destroyed, um, you know, during, uh, during the pandemic. So, so I think that you know the pandemic has just gone, you know, to to increase the 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 pains that that communities already face, and I think you, you know it further provides an argument, you know, for the type of uh, uh, solutions in terms of supporting these communities to build uh, resilience. Uh, and I think that uh, you know supporting you know community groups, you know, enabling you know women and, and, and women leaders, you know, to to take uh, you know positions, you know, sit at the table. Uh, to represent their communities in terms of pushing their own agenda in terms of how um, and, and the best ways in, in which uh, they, they can be supported to, to achieve uh, their goals. Uh, and I think that part of it uh, as well, really, in terms of uh, going forward, you know, building on these community networks um, is, is, is the ability really to, to support, you know, community entrepreneurship and, and you know, business incubation. Uh, you know, in, in these communities that allows, you know, women and, and their communities, you know, to, to build, you know, resilient uh, systems that allow them not only to deal with the pandemic, but also deal with the climate emergencies that they have to deal with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have now a question from, um, from, um, from, from European Forest Institute. Um, how has COVID-19 affected the domestic timber markets in the Congo Basin and in the seven countries that, uh, in which Rikov conducted the survey? How would the panelists suggest that we can build back the domestic timber markets in a better way? And what sort of policy supports would be needed in addition to the economic financial supports that uh, you both have mentioned in your uh, presentations. Um, Dr. Gans, would you like to reply first? And then I will give the floor to uh, Dr. Zibane. Yeah, I mean, um, I think first and foremost, uh, from my perspective, the, uh, the aspect of, of community forests and supply, there, there are many areas in Southeast Asia and South Asia where communities are not allowed uh, to harvest trees. They're allowed to harvest non-timber forest products, but not actually um, have any uh, timber proceeds. So the first thing I would say in terms of domestic timber supply would be to allow communities who do have um, some level of, of uh, tenure or resource rights um, to harvest trees and to benefit from a domestic market. Uh, that first and foremost would be my starting point. Secondly, in terms of improving the, the market uh, chains, because um, I think uh, in, in, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, there's tremendous domestic buying power. And that buying power, if people are, are educated enough about certification schemes or uh, about what Flag T or Red Plus is trying to do, ultimately those consumers could be making much, much better decisions about where their furniture comes from, where their paneling comes from, where their flooring comes from. And that ultimately is a public awareness campaign that needs to happen. Uh, it has started, I, I would say in, in places like Thailand, the awareness or certainly around or organic produce or what people put into their body has started, but it hasn't really shifted into wood products yet. And, uh, ultimately, it has to move in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. I'm being told from uh, back, uh, the sort of uh, technology and the communication officer that unfortunately, we actually do have to end the session at 11 on the dot. And so, uh, Dr. Zibane, if, um, if you would like to uh, answer that question in writing, and then we will be able to uh, send to all participants, because unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left, and mm -hmm. we need to go on to uh, closing, closing remarks. Again, 
Yeah. Yeah, Alex, I do, just just a second because I think that's really the specificity of the Congo Basin. You know, I'll be 30, 30 seconds and and I just that you know clearly from from our study, you know, there was clearly a rise in artisanal logging that was uh, uh, reported in our study, uh, and I think that. Um, the, 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 the domestic market, really, if you're looking at uh, Cameroon, for example, there was another study that was done by, by Sahil, where they actually found that during the pandemic, if you went to um, the, 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 the timber parks, that there was actually you know, a decline in the availability of, uh, of timber. But I think that public procurement uh, processes you know, are also opportunities that could allow uh, you know, local communities you know, to access you know, the, the timber market. But, but also I think there's work going on in Cameroon as well with uh, the association called the Feka Pobwa, you know, trying to explore ways in terms of, uh, you know, facilitating access of uh, community forest to the domestic timber market, but also uh, timber traceability systems, you know, that allow communities, you know, to track the, the legality that, of timber that is entering into, into the market. Uh, so, so I think those are some of the key, um, you know, approaches as well that could also uh, support the legality and improve the, the domestic timber market or, or push the domestic timber market to, to become legal, particularly with regards to public procurement, um, you know, in addition to some of the ideas that uh, Dr. Gans has uh, highlighted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, for uh, the, uh, those additional uh, remarks. Um, next time we will have a longer session. <laughs> and so in order to allow uh, participants to interact uh, more, uh, with with the panelists, um, uh, our time for questions is up. But um, as I said, you will have the opportunity to you write in your questions and to have them answered in the next couple of days. I would now like to give the floor to Miss Sophie Grohls from the Far Faust Forest and Farm Facility for closing remarks. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you, Alexia. <clears throat> I hope I can make it in, in the time uh, that you have assigned me. So the forest and farm uh, facility is a partnership between FEO, IID, IUCN and IGRICORD and has also engaged in COVID surveys and subsequent responses with the forest and farm producer organizations or how we call it FFPOs. Uh, the forest and farm facility is mandated to support directly FFPOs in forest landscapes, which also comprises forest community producers and indigenous peoples. Uh, for, uh, we see FFPOs exist locally around the world as member-based associations, which are platforms managed by women, men, including young, young people, and depending on forest and farms for their livelihoods. This makes them critical actors on the ground during times of crisis to maintain their efficient use of resources. Farmers and forest users are very much aware of the changes in their landscapes, predicting and addressing risk in the first line. Our findings also based on surveys and updates uh, from our partner FFPOs are very much in line with the findings of RECOFT-C and C CIDT. Forest and farm producers uh, reported serious impacts which are differentiated according to levels of wealth, gender, indigenous peoples, or smallholder family farmers. They have suffered from decreased incomes, increased debts, increased food insecurity, more illegality, displacement, loss of properties, and, and even no. loss of lives. Yeah. Women have been particularly affected by this crisis to increase household workload, workload and gender-based violence while their income uh, decreased significantly. Despite all these challenges, these rural and, rural and forest based communities are not sitting idle because they are on the front lines of the impact of COVID-19, but also other challenges such as those related to climate change. So in short, we, we could hear already that FF, FFPOs and rural communities play vital roles in immediately Im, Im, immediate emergency responses to COVID-19. Uh, some examples that we heard is FFPOs and their enterprises, they play a vital role in local e economies as employers, suppliers, and as buyers. So they keep the local economy running. They also had uh, 
an important role in the flow of information that reaches to the that can reach to the local level and they can also support with uh, tra uh, translating and transmitting information in local languages and they also have often uh, they have been uh, uh, providing social protection services in terms of health education and childcare, they have done that, but now even more during the response in, in COVID. We have seen examples, for instance, in Nepal, where FECOFUN, the Federation of Community Users in Nepal, has organized quarantine premises and food distribution uh, to the most vulnerable. So these are examples of, of response, but further, FFPOs are also key partners to help build back better to secure more resilient production systems and are just key partners for the green recovery. So we have also, I don't know, the, the conclusion that we had uh, uh, after, uh, after this webinar that we held on multi-dimensional resilience of producer organizations is that FFPOs and forest dependent communities offer grounded solutions for response and resilience in building back better, securing forest landscape production systems and introducing innovative solutions that will be necessary in the post-COVID-19 uh, world. Thank Daphne, you. you had some more uh, points that you wanted yeah. to add. No? My final comments are thanking to, to thank Dr. Gantz and yeah. Dr. Ndien really for your presentation. And we will, um, I think we're offline now, <laughs> but we will be following up to respond to the questions on policy, finance, gender, and general conclusions from this meeting, we can follow up remotely and respond to questions. But your interventions were excellent, and we will also be sending information on where to find more information on the follow-up studies, because I think the public information that's coming out of these two studies is going to be of great interest to everybody here today and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you to all. Thank you. Recording will be sent with um, also questions that have not been answered. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a good day.